Okay, everybody strapped in? Yeah, ready to go. Okay. Welcome. Welcome, everyone, uh, to uh, today's live stream of Mars Horizon again uh, by Auroc Digital and published by the, <laughs> the Irregular Corp. It's another day in Gem and Mike's space agency, and we're going to show <laughs> you some, uh, some new missions today and stuff. But first of all, Gem, please introduce our guests who we're very excited to have join us today. Cool. So we've got today joining us Libby Jackson. She's the Human Exploration Program Manager at the UK Space Agency. Super awesome title. Our guests always have the most amazing job yeah, titles. Yeah. Um, do you want to explain a little bit about what your job involves, Libby? Uh, yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for having me. Um, My pleasure. I, I, I look after the UK's interests in human exploration, is what I want to say. So I'm a civil servant. I work at the UK Space Agency. And the Space Agency really sort of steers policy and direction for civil space. So, so what we do, which underpins so many, so much of our everyday lives. We, we're talking about um, the telecommunication satellites that we all use, the, the global navigation positioning satellites that we all use to go and find stuff out. Loads going on. Um, but specifically, yeah, I look after our interests in what happens on the space station, the scientists, lots of scientists in the UK who use the International Space Station, but also there's other facilities here on Earth, like parabolic flights and drop towers and bed rest studies, where we can study bits of space and, and help us understand things. And, and we I look after that and, and the community and the industry who are there supporting all of this as well. Yeah, so lots of lots of people involved, lots of areas to be involved in. Mm. Well, it's great to have you joining Mike and Gems Space Agency for the day. Uh, <laughs> yeah. you, you, you've joined us at a very uh, exciting moment, actually, Libby. We're just about to launch. Uh, it's a hot day, uh, so we thought, why not double down on it? Let's go to Mercury. <laughs> so, so we're just about to launch a um, a little mission to Mercury. We're going to send an advanced orbital probe to capture a high resolution map of the crater surface and to learn more about its. its uh, geological history it's an Ooh, it's mike. an ambitious mission got some uh, feedback from the comms team your mic's a little bit close to your mouth so again a bit of feedback how's that yeah a bit better okay cool so yeah it's a, it's a diplomatic mission actually we're doing this one in joint uh, uh in partnership with the soviet union Ooh. who uh, yeah, hey. yeah they're actually they're contributing 64 percent to all all mission costs and uh if we do this right going to up our reputation with the Soviet Union, which is always good. So um, before we actually, before we do launch, let's just have a little quick look at our our situation. So we've got uh, quite a bit of money coming in, but then we do have quite a few astronauts um, and other buildings as well. Science wise, um, so because we're about to go on to this mercurial history mission, um, we've got a lot of projected income. So actually, without further ado, let's go straight to the launch. Yeah, love a launch. Fingers crossed, everyone, that it goes well for us. So, Libby, basically, um, what we're about to do is launch this rocket, and let me tell you, it's raining. It's raining pretty hard. Uh, we've got 95% launch reliability, adjusted to 82% because of the bad conditions. Now, I know what you're going to say, Libby. You're going to say, don't launch that. <laughs> the, the, the Soviets are very good at launching in all kinds of weathers, um, but this looks like this isn't a Soviet launch. This looks like it might be um, out going out French Guiana or something. You it? are absolutely correct. Yeah, this is being launched <laughs> from Europe spaceport in in uh, in Guyana. So, okay, well, you know these conditions aren't so great. And normally, normally I just launch, then I jam. And normally, what happens? It it, it, it it blows up. So you know, just for this one. Just this once, let's reschedule this mission to November. <laughs> oh, the Orignauts are ready for the explosion. Look, we've learned, guys. We've grown as people. <laughs> Maybe this time. Okay, cool. So, let me just... Um, so later it was on, so easy to do. Yeah. So later yeah, so we book it and then we'll just wait a few months. We're allowed to... We can skip the time. Because obviously, I guess, in, the, in real life... Just, it's, quite a bit of wait between the launches <laughs> yeah yeah we can just make the time go quickly <laughs> i bet you, you wish you could do that I, I i'm wishing i could reschedule launches at a click of a button like that and then just <laughs> you know wait three months and go oh yeah it was that was very easy that was wonderful <laughs> okay this looks like slightly better conditions now adequate conditions 97 percent launch reliability i think we're going to oh, go so one of the things in our game we try and capture, Libby, is the excitement and the tension around the launches. So what's it like in mission control during an actual launch? It must be electric. 
it is, but it's it's very calm and very concentrated uh, because everyone's there and they've got a job to do. And you've gone through it lots and lots of times before because you've practiced and you've gone through simulation after simulation after simulation. So you know what's coming. You're prepared for what happens and what if and what if and what if the weather's not great or, or what if something happens um, with the rocket halfway up. But I've only sat, I, I've never been in control of a rocket going up. I've, I've only been in control of, of things when they've got into space. But I've watched the launches happen because you know something's coming. Um, and even then, for me, I was always like, I, I would never believe it was going to go until you go because uh, rocket launches can, can move, something will happen. Um, actually, the Soviet, well, the Russians today, the Soviet Union, as you've got here, um, they are far more, far more reliable. So, so those you sort of go, no, it's going to go. But something out of French Guiana, you, you wait and see um, for it to happen. But yeah, once, once you're there, it's very concentrated. It's very calm and quiet. Um, even though there's so much at stake, people aren't panicked about it or worried about it because then you couldn't do your job. So everyone's trained and, and they really know what they're doing. Yeah. And is it like very different with a crude launch versus the uncrewed ones? It, yeah, it's an interesting question. Yes and no, you are always very aware when you've got humans on the top. And um, you that does bring an extra edge, but anything that you put on top of a rocket has had hundreds, thousands of people working on it for a long, long time. Um, sometimes sort of e even much more, something like a, a, a trip um, to Mercury, um, there's, there's ESA's Beppe Colombo mission coming up pretty soon. That's been, you know, it can be 20 years in the planning from the original um, gem of the idea through the mission studies, through building it, through waiting for the launch window. Um, and you, you're not going to get another one. Yeah. Now, with astronauts, when they're sitting on top of a rocket, if something goes wrong, we have safety systems. We have escape capsules um, and so on. We saw it recently with um, a Soyuz launch and the crew, something went wrong with the rocket, the crew separated from it and they landed safely. If something goes wrong with a rocket when you've stuck a, a, a great scientific payload on it, you, you're not going to get rescued. So actually, yeah. the kind of... Um, the, the the concerns are, are, are different, and um, it's, yeah, it, it, it's I watch a, an an uncrewed um, launch, something with spacecraft on it, and you are just as relieved when it gets into orbit because it's yeah, it, it's years and years and years of hard work to get to that point, and it's mm. it can it can disappear. It, as you, I'm hearing, you have perhaps seen sometimes in <laughs> in the game, it can disappear in an instant. Yeah, we have lost quite a few. Six was our record on our last stream. Yeah. So our probes actually just got, uh, just finally reached Mercury now. It's now April 1991 and it's uh, it's looking pretty hot uh, <laughs> around here. Because it, it took a long time to get there. Uh, yeah, it, yeah. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. So, um, right. So I'm going to have to finish this mission. Now, this is an interesting mission because I have to balance the amount of heat that the, that the probe's getting mm. in order to do this. So let's see where best to start. If I start by getting some data and combining that with the heat, that not only reduces the amount of heat that we've got affecting the payload, but um, allows us to do a polar orbit thingy. And then if we do a bit of that... And a bit of that. Let's see how we do. So with the launches, Libby, as well, so you've got the initial launch. How long after the launch from Earth does the tension die down? Because that's not the end, is it? It's not just it's up and then you're like, nothing to worry about. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and um, you, you see this. Uh, so to, to give you an example, um, I work really closely um, with Tim Peake's flight, the British astronaut, and um, managed his education programme. And so I watched that launch um, from the Science Museum with 3,000 screaming children in the media were there, everything. <laughs> and everyone counts down and the, the, the rocket goes and, and, and it's off the pad. And at that point, everybody in the room cheered and they lost interest. <laughs> and someone, someone came up and tapped me on the shoulder after a couple of minutes and tried to talk to me. I said, no, 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 go away. <laughs> because, because it's, it's for, cr for crew, for, for humans going up to the space station. Um, there's 10 minutes just to get from Earth up into space. And so until, until you're sort of safely all the way through that rocket ride and in space, that's sort of goal number one. But then whether it's whether it's humans in, in, in a spacecraft or it's a, um, a mission, you know, any spacecraft, you've got to do things like deploy the solar arrays. And that comes next. And if you don't deploy the solar arrays, if they don't work, 
you haven't got a mission. So you're sort of always mentally checking off all these things and saying, right, I'm in space, but now I've got to make sure I've got solar arrays. Um, in the case of, of getting to the space station, you've then got to fire the rocket engines, the, th the thrusters on, on the spacecraft to get it in the right place. Mm -hmm. And then you're counting down, well, is it going to get somewhere? In, in a mission to someone like uh, Mercury or, or the missions that are heading off to Mars this summer um, to go land on Mars, the first thing was orbit. The next thing is, can you get to Mars? Then you, you know, can can you get on your trajectory to Mars? Can you find, you know, get on the way to Mars? Then you've got to land. So there's, there's, yeah, it's never just the launch. There's always something else coming along along the way, because ultimately, whatever the mission is, you want to get all the way to the successful conclusion, whether that's humans landing safely back on Earth, or landing on another planet and going and exploring, or getting safely into orbit around Mercury and then what happens with the science and the data and why is it you've gone? You want that to happen. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Speaking of which, nice segue. Our, our, <laughs> our probe has just captured some lovely, stunning, high-resolution images of one of Mercury's most dramatic features, the Calaris Basin. So that's good. Oh, excellent. We've got, so we've some... got 20 support from yeah. uh, the public. That's good. Yeah, the public do love a lovely space photo. Well, they do. <laughs> Okay, so what's coming up next? So I'm just about to do a uh, an orbital EVA request mission just to uh, just to keep our science income ticking over. But what I've actually got my eye on coming up is launching a space station, something along the lines of Skylab, not a modular one, just a straight up first up space station. We'll do that shortly. Um, oh, I'm hiring crew. Do we want to rename any of these? <laughs> plucky fellows. Libby, do, yeah. I, do any of these look like anyone you work with? Well, can I be one, maybe? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Why not? I don't get to be an astronaut very often. I, 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 uh, there we go. Here you go. Let's, uh, let's hire my read M. Brand Theory and rename her. <laughs> Libby Jackson. Libby Jackson. <laughs> we warn you in advance. Our I, I, astronauts don't always see the full service <laughs> I, I was about to say i feel like this is perhaps you know uh there could be the highlight of my life being an astronaut but i'd sense i might be doomed <laughs> potentially we did send up some of our uh, community members last time we renamed the astronauts we had three of them on one uh, rocket and it blew up and we lost all of them <laughs> but yes and if we take those gambles in our game we don't have to play it like you would in real life where you don't take any chances we just love a chance it's fine <laughs> Okay, let's set this launch date and um, crikey. Would it be something you'd, you'd, you'd like ever do, Libby? Oh, I, I would love to if someone gave me the choice um, and the opportunity. I would have been lucky enough to experience microgravity. Wow. Uh, I, mentioned, like? I, I mentioned parabolic flights earlier on, um, which is a, um, a, a, fly, a plane that, that flies parabolas. Um, essentially, the, 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 there's a team of three pilots and they kick it uh, with the engines and it's like it's like kicking a football through the air but you're sort of kicking the plane through space and and as you go over the top of the parabola everything in it is weightless and this is great for doing um science in it um we've got scientists across the uk who use it you could do technology demonstrators if you want to check something out is this you know connection going to work in space you get about 30 seconds at a time wow. and that was uh, yeah I, I helped with an experiment and that was uh, amazing um, and then, but you sort of, it's a good question because later this year we are expecting the European Space Agency to put out another call for astronauts. And so um, everybody across Europe uh, will have the opportunity to um, join that. But I would say now it's not the only way to space anymore. If, if, if the, I would say this particularly to young people. I think if people start saving now, um, commercial sort of suborbital tourism, going on a, a little plane, um, perhaps, who knows, even one day out of the UK, um, up into space for sort of experiencing weightlessness for six, ten minutes. That is going to be an achievable thing in, in the coming years. And I know when I grew up, I kind of dreamed of flying on Concorde and that you could save money and fly on Concorde. Right. And then Concorde retired before I ever got a chance. But that sort of dream, I think, is there for young people today. So there you go. Our community members, you can apply to be an astronaut or you can be a or not, I guess you could just save up and go. <laughs> That'd be amazing. I think I'd be a bit scared to go in space. We were talking, we like talking about the food that they eat up there. I love mm. chicken nuggets. So I always talk about like the crumbless nugget that would be need to be invented because uh, Emmett 
Fletcher from the European Space Agency mm. was telling us they can't have crumbs in space, it's too dangerous. They can't, but, and you're right, but the way the Russians have got around this with bread is by um, sending up bite-sized loaves. So if you had a really bite-sized nugget, you didn't have to bite into it, and then somehow you could pop it in your mouth before the crumbs got everywhere, that might be a lot. So, 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 loaf. Loaf. so the, loaf, loaf. the loaf is like that, an inch big? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. mini bite-sized loaves. Oh, wow, I didn't know that. We're going to have to bake some bite-sized loaves now and have our own space food for when the game comes out. That's awesome. And I looked this up. I didn't know about that. I'm always into the, uh, the food in space. Like, yeah, they've got yeah, the yeah. lettuces they've grown in space as well. Mm. Do you think yeah. they would taste different to normal lettuce? The reports that have come back from the crew are that, nope, they, they were fine. And it's a really important thing because we hope they're going to send humans back to the moon all the way to Mars one day. And there is only so long you can eat tin food for and, and yeah. not go stir crazy. So That's understanding right. this is important for that. But we also learn how plants grow, which is all about understanding then, you know, how can we better grow plants here on Earth as well? And as in the world that gets ever hotter and uh, more crowded at the minute, you know, food sustainability and security is a really interesting thing. It's where that kind of thing is where you see a lot of crossover between what we're doing in space and space exploration and how it comes back and helps us all every day so this does this does fascinating to me so all the stuff you learn about the human body in space it directly benefits our understanding of human or human body on it on it it's uh, yeah amazing yeah it really does if you go into space you essentially get old really quickly and uh, so it, it, it's really helpful for <laughs> Try um, being a video game producer <laughs> really helpful for all the scientists who want to understand aging processes you, you can take a very healthy person and and watch what happens in space and, and actually they can be they're pretty good guinea pigs and you can't do that with you know older population because it's they've had many different things and yeah it wouldn't be right or fair to put an 80 year old through some of the things we put astronauts through do they recover when they come back do they recover to the way they were pre-flight or is it is it like more permanent do we not know yet no, there are some some people experience some permanent changes, and that's one of the things that uh, we're really trying to understand. Um, we say particularly, how would you send humans um, out to Mars? Um, some things that uh, uh, come back. So, so bones and muscles both get weaker as you're you're floating around in space. You're not using them, and for a roughly, and it it varies of course between people. But for a six month stay in space, it can take a year for your body to get back to full bone density and, and full muscles. Oh. But um, some astronauts experience permanent changes of vision. Um, some of them have got the, there's there's other things that we're still discovering and learning about um, that can yeah can be permanent. So lots to learn. Yeah, but then Emmett was telling us the astronauts that he's spoken to. Every single one is like, I will go straight back. Like <laughs> they just love space. <laughs> So I guess it's worth it. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's quite a view and quite a, a, a different yeah, place to live in. And of course, they, they all wanted to be astronauts, but they applied. So yeah. no one is forced to go into their spa into space <laughs> against their will at the moment. <laughs> well, so far, um, Libby, I've got good news. Your, your, your crude EVA is going very, very well. I'm just just sorting the re-entry so we don't get too hot. We've made sure that the drift is nice and uh, not too wonky. And I think... We should just literally about to, uh, with any luck, bring you home. There we go. Oh. So in, in a couple of seconds, you'll see. I am not home yet. It's like everything you said, you know, is, is the re-entry <laughs> going to go to plan or the parachute's going to open? You don't relax until the crew are safely um, on board. See, look at these parachutes. Ah, Here we see. go. <laughs> so we had a question in the chat. Someone has asked if there's been any uh, meaningful progress with getting a UK spaceport. The spaceports are a really interesting thing and absolutely there is progress the, the, from a UK space agency um, point of view um, we are supporting the regulation um, to really put in place the structures to make this happen and then there are different places have left it open to the market to, who, who, who wants to do what and there are different um, spaceports making progress in, in different areas um, down in Cornwall um, it's uh, there's one in Wales up in um, uh, north coast of Scotland, the one in north coast of Scotland's recently got planning permission. Um, so they're all moving in different places and, and different ways, but absolutely there is there is progress there. And um, we're still looking forward to seeing launch from the UK in the, in the next few years. That'd be very exciting. And we can work, we have lots of time to figure out crumbless biscuits, because obviously <sighs> we will have to take them up being British. Mm. <laughs> um, so I just actually got um, a, a new milestone. I'm just going to show off part of the game which uh, we've not shown before this is spacepedia 
So this is where basically um, every kind of thing that you come across, be it a milestone or a rocket or indeed a planet, has got its own entry in Spacepedia. So we just did the orbital EVA, so have a, let's have a little look. So if you manage to perform the orbital EVA in the game and then go to Spacepedia, you will have this little entry explaining all about the history of orbital EVAs. Um, there he is. Hey guys, you can learn all about the different parts of space as you're playing the game. Yeah. Become even more of a space expert, ready for when you apply for the astronaut program. Right. <laughs> so, hang on, where, where's the one I really like? I think we've got Rosalind Franklin here as well. Yeah, there we there go. go. Hang on, here's a good bit, ready? Whoop. Oh, look at the <laughs> I do think the rovers are so cute. It's like, <laughs> oh, look. Libby, do they make the rovers look cute on purpose? No, they don't. They, they they really do just design them based on, on what is there. It, 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 again, back to one of the great things about space. When you're designing any space mission, you're very constrained. You've only got so much space on top of your rocket. You've only got so much mass that you can get into space because you know sending more, you're going to need a bigger rocket and that's going to cost more. It doesn't exist or so on. Um, you've then got to make sure that there's enough power. And, and you saw on Rosalind Franklin that, that she's powered by solar arrays. You make the solar arrays bigger, so you've got more um, energy to power your instruments, but then everything gets bigger. So it's a huge balancing act of all the different things. And that's what drives the design. And, and in the case of Rosalind Franklin, the, the sort of head, the eyes, they really are the eyes, is the cameras. And you want those high up, just, just the same reason our eyes are on top of our head. It's easier to see further. Um, so it's, it's, it, it may not be a surprise when you look at the design that it evolves into something we recognize for that same reason of being eyes and you know widespread solar panels are like uh, to collect the most energy which is yeah sort of look like wings but it's it's all about the the, the physics uh, and the engineering that drives the design yeah they'd be like jim we don't have weight to put googly eyes on all the rovers. <laughs> wouldn't that be nice though <laughs> i'd want to do it um so here's something we, we also were wondering about. So in our game, you can succeed in the missions that you do by completing your main task, gathering resources and information. Um, and then you can overachieve and do some bonus tasks. So do you ever have missions exceeding their original parameters? And then do you have like stretch goals when you're launching? Always. And, and it's always sort of there in the back of people's minds because it is so difficult to put things into space. But it comes back to that rocket launch we had at the beginning. Um, there is always a degree of, of well, there's, there's a lot of degree of making sure things are going to work. So sometimes that sort of results in over-engineering because if, if you want to something to last for a year, you want to make sure that it's going to last a year. And, and so often in people's minds there is, well, once we get to the end of that year, we've got a fully functioning spacecraft, what else could we do? And uh, one of my favorite missions that really had some stretch goals and really exceeded its desired expectations was um, NASA's little pair of, um, Mars rovers that were called Spirit and Opportunity and they were designed, I'm going to get the numbers wrong, but it was, a, it was about 90 days they were due to, to last for and it's, it's, they, they lasted for years and it was, I think it was um, Opportunity managed 10, 12 years on the surface oh, of Mars wow. it was amazing and yeah this is it's always something that's considered and it's always a question of budgets and what other science is there left to do um, you got uh, another example was the, the Cassini mission, which was the European Space Agency mission that went around Saturn. And, and that completed its uh, main mission and we did a few more things. But eventually that we had to um, crash it into Saturn. We couldn't let it kind of run until it died because or, or ran out of fuel. Because uh, at Saturn, there is a, a moon called Enceladus out there, which is really interesting. It, it looks like it might have or has all the conditions that you think oh, maybe there could be life on there. We didn't want the Cassini spacecraft to run out of fuel, run out, go out of control, and then eventually perhaps crash into Enceladus. So that mission we chose to end, or we was you know, the European Space Agency, cho chose to end it, and um, we sent it in a in a death dive in in oh. and, and and that was the end of the mission. Um, so it, missions end in different ways for, yeah. for different reasons, but there is yeah often a, a thought about. If we achieve our objectives, what might we do if we had time and if we have money? Yeah, I guess you're never just going to switch it off and be like, well, now we're done. Yeah, we're done. Yeah, <laughs> they're sending on a little death dive. Oh, that's sweet. 
So I'm just preparing to do a Saturn flyby. Gem, I've made a rocket without consulting you on a name, unfortunately. It's called Crumbo. But... <laughs> Someone just said in the chat, did you seriously call that Crumbo? Perfect. I approve. <laughs> good, good. Um, it's quite an interesting rocket, this one, actually. Um, what I've done is I've put... Um, I'm using a Delta IV booster, and I've put a couple of Delta uh, supplementaries on the side. The, another thing I've done that we haven't done on the stream yet is I've, uh, I've added a, a, our first upgrade. Now, you get upgrades by completing request missions. I've added an op onboard camera. Why would you put an onboard camera on the outside of a rocket, you may ask? Well, because everyone wants to see the rocket taking off and all the flames and stuff. It's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and it adds, gives us loads of extra support. So. It's been one of the things that... Um has happened as, as technology's got better over the last years. We, we have seen more and more all these amazing pictures on, on uh, the, yeah, the rockets that take off. You see the Earth from space. Yeah. Um, it blows my mind. It's beautiful. It, it's been one of the great things of, yes, for camera technology minimi minimizing. Have you got a you start to, sorry. Have you got a favorite um, space photo, like an iconic space photo? Oh, one of my favorites is uh, taken by the Galileo spacecraft which was one of the early spacecraft that, that headed out into the solar system. And that was the first time the space, we were, had a picture turned back and it took a picture of the Earth and the Moon in the same photo, just hanging together in space. And I, it's, to me, it's beautiful. And you start understanding we live in a 3D world and, yeah. and the Moon's orbiting it. And that's what I was about to say, that all of this imagery from space, whether it's the yeah, missions heading off um, out into the solar system or, or the imagery on rockets looking back it really connects with people and you understand the earth in a different way you understand our position in the universe in a different way um one of the reasons i think that space is so inspiring but it, it yeah well you really sort of comes back to the fact that we're here on planet earth and it's this little thing and we need to protect it and one of the great things then people say oh space and you know, do you need it well the one of my favorite stats is that um over 50 percent I say well over half of the measurements we need to take to, to monitor what's happening to the Earth, global warming, climate change, these things, they can only be taken from space. So spacecraft out in space, looking back at Earth, monitoring the sea, the temperatures, all these things, they're, they're giving us the tools we need to understand our planet better and, and look after it better. And I suppose the um, advancements of cameras and, and imagery like that is helping younger and younger people to understand what's going on in space and, and the technology and getting up there because mm. like reading about it is one thing but we be able to see a picture or see the rockets taking off see from yeah. on the rocket taken off mm. it's just amazing mm. i know exactly what you're talking about as well about that sudden sense of 3d or depth of like where you where you are we we my wife and i had this telescope and a couple of years ago we got it out to kind of like have a proper look at jupiter because it was a really clear night and we could actually see like the moons around it and then and it was <sighs> then you, you got this kind of proper oh that's really far away and, mm. and then you get this it clicks like that it is not just a a, 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 a white dot on the sky it's, it's, it's yeah yeah i know yeah. love it yeah. So what am I doing now? So I've just um, we're just sending a probe out to sand. So it's just the first part where we're basically lining up and we're getting enough thrust together to um, kick ourselves out of Earth orbit. So this may take a little while. So while Mike's doing that, could you give us a brief rundown of uh, Tim's work on the International Space Station and what you were doing with that, his mission around it? Yeah, so Tim Peake spent six months on the International Space Station, which is a standard sort of tour of duty at the minute for any astronaut. And he was doing day to day what, what all the astronauts and the cosmonauts do up there. They, they, the first thing to know is, is they work really hard. Um, they, they have a working week, uh, Monday to Friday. Um, it's not nine till five. It's more like eight till seven. Um, but they have to pack two hours of exercise every day into that just to, to keep themselves healthy. So that if they ever needed to come back to Earth, they could get out of their capsule themselves. It, it helps with their bones and their muscles coming back. But the primary reason is in case of an emergency, you need to be able to be strong enough to, to get yourself home. But, but what you do in that working week is not what I think perhaps some people imagine they do, which is you know, float around looking out the window, play guitar. <laughs> and they're, they're, they, are, they are keeping the space station going and all the experiments that happen. On it. So there are over... 200 experiments that happen every six months on the International Space Station from scientists all over the world. 
Uh, the crew themselves are some of them. So Tim had was giving blood. He had muscle biopsies going on, all about understanding how the human body changes. But most of those experiments, the crew don't do much more than go and sort of put it in place, let it go. And then it's the scientists and the engineers on Earth who monitor it, see what's going on, run the experiment. And the astronauts are there to help if things go wrong or that you know, they're changing out experiments, putting new ones in. And, and that keeps their days very busy. Uh, they do a little bit of PR. Um, the evenings and weekends, they get to, to sort of relax. They, they each have their own little um, cupboard-sized bedroom, really the size of a telephone box. And um, they, they you know, get together, watch movies, that they eat dinner. But they've really worked very, very hard. Mm. Yeah, really long hours, isn't it? <laughs> mm. And um, OK. No, 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 it's all right. I'm just, I'm just um, setting up a Skylab space station. I'll be back shortly. <laughs> um, how did you go about connecting Tim's work with the public as well? So your education outreach program. Ah, uh, that was so much fun. I'm just uh, sorry. I'm, I, I've lost my lost my live stream of what's going on. So I just restarted that. Um, Tim, Tim's flight. We really wanted to make the most of for inspiring young people. Tim did as well. Um, UK Space Agency did. Uh, European Space Agency because it was the first time um, since Helen Sharman flew back in 1991 that, that Britain had had an astronaut in space. So it was a whole new generation of people discovering space for the first time. Um, so I, I was very fortunate to be put in charge of running the education program. We had 34 different projects um, that really linked into all sorts of different bits of the curriculum right across the different ages because if you want to learn, space is a wonderful context for learning. You can look at space and go, oh, I want to understand the maths of it, or I want to draw a picture of it, or I'm going to write a poem about it. It, it really is just a subject and a context that takes you in so many different ways. In the same way that the space sector has people in it doing all kinds of different things. So, you know, as well as the engineers and the scientists, there are people at the UK Space Agency who are our finance team and who are, there are lawyers who work with us. There are comms people who are you know, writing the stories. There's so many different ways um, to get into the space sector. Uh, but it was, we, we had um, so much fun really trying to make sure that as many people as possible found out about Tim's flight and that young people got involved. And it, it was crazy. We reached um, one in three schools and uh, two, three million young people um, actively took part in education activities around um, Tim's flight. It, it, was, it was really phenomenal. And we're just coming up on five years. Sorry. I was going to say, kids can really understand, like, astronauts, even so young, like my little niece, about six, and she was going on and on about Tim Peake. Like, she's mm. always amazing. And it's like, mm. yeah, when they're that young yeah. to understand it. It is wonderful. And if it inspires them to see that science and technology are of fine and you know exciting and okay places in a world that for some people um people still say to them oh, you shouldn't do science you shouldn't do technology it, it's you know, it's crazy we, we need everybody to see that if it's something they want to do they can come and get involved with we, we live in a very technical technological society today and the space is there everywhere it, it, it's it's something that underpins everything we do mm. Yeah, it's what we like about Mars Horizon as well, trying to show like there's so many different areas in the space industry you can work. So you've got the rocket designs, the budgeting, mm. planning, all of it, mission control, not just the astronauts. There are so many more uh, roles for people, mm. whatever their interest is. So many, so many here in the UK and, and all, all around the world. Um. Okay, so I'm just setting up our a very exciting launch of our space station. Oh, what's this? Um, I've made a great big great big uh, launch and also you can just see here at this let's see this little path here just coming up to Saturn that is yeah. our Saturn flyby mission which is four months away from needing our attention again Ooh. so we actually get there but anyway we are now about to launch launch our space station Libby you're back on this one heading heading uh, heading out. Looks I've, like, I've still made it yeah yeah you skinny your teeth um, <laughs> no other agencies have, have uh, made this um, space station yet. It's I think we're in the what mid eighties now in the game. Eighty eight, I think. Okay. So it'd be nice to you know just it's not it's not a competition, but it would like to it would be nice to get a space uh, station up before the other agencies. Yeah, so Mars Rising, you can choose to be more competitive with the other agencies or choose to work together. Uh, 
and share the costs, share the, the glory and the research. And the shame. <laughs> Do it with our space agency, yeah. yeah. We just tend to like launch them all. <laughs> I'd say this is going to be a good launch. Um, very good weather start. conditions. 99%. There's always a percent though, there's always a chance. So it's never really. There is always a chance it could pop. I think we're safe. I think we're good. doing well. Look at this, it's our most successful stream. <laughs> so far, this is a record for me. No one's. Um... I, I don't think I could play the game in a in a risk adverse a risk adverse right. way. I think I'd be going no 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 no. I've got to do this properly. It's uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'd never do that in real life, and I'd probably be very very slow compared to some other people. <laughs> but you would you would succeed because uh, obviously just like in real life, if if your uh, rocket explodes, you lose a lot of money. Public support can pull you back a bit, so you've got to juggle. Is it worth the risk? Mm. It's fun to be able to do what you can't do in real life. Just launch them all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But one thing that's really nice about it, <clears throat> excuse me, is um, we you can kind of tailor quite a lot of the difficulty level. So if you just kind of want a, a nice mellow, nothing's going to go wrong. I just want, you know, the, the, the fantasy of running a space agency. We, you can knock shit down. There's no shame. And if you want uh, the brutality of, of <laughs> realism, yeah, it's there. There's something for everyone. <laughs> but yeah, I do prefer this. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. So, you know, a lot of people watching the stream will be noticing Mike normally breaks a lot more stuff by now. Mike's normally blown up this and that and the other. Why is he doing so well? Well, it's because I tweet the difficulty. <laughs> <laughs> I have, just for this stream especially, I've created uh, my own little, and anyone who uh, plays Mars Horizon will be able to do this, I've made my own custom difficulty, which is just going a little bit easier on me. It's, a, it's, it's very hot, Gem, as, you will, uh, as you'll attest to. Um, it is very warm. <laughs> let's give ourselves a bit of an easier ride this time. Yeah, because when we did the beta, we had a lot of feedback. Some people were like, it was super intense. I love the drama. And other people were like, I loved it. It was a really nice, chilled out game I could play. So we thought we would cater to all audiences of how they like to how they like to run their own space agency. Yeah. I like to everything to blow up all the time, so it's very exciting. But yeah. <laughs> Do you have different settings? Can you dial in, like, you know, yes, fun and uh, Armageddon style things? Yeah, versus, it's, it's, um, <laughs> essentially, yeah. I think we're calling our difficulties pioneer explorer um things like that so they so they're not kind of like oh you you know <laughs> you should be playing this one they're, they're more kind of yeah the different experiences experiential mm. yeah, things okay yeah so what sort of game you want to play you want to chill out afternoon it's a bit hot or if you want an intense dramatic time <laughs> where you're feeling charged up and you can choose <laughs> so yeah, we don't. As we've actually rescheduled the launch today, but normally we don't. But like in real life, how close to a launch can you reschedule them? How far in advance do you need to um, know forever? You can reschedule them down to the last millisecond. I, the, you know, launches have been scrubbed because you you fuel the rocket up, you get everything there, and and all the way down through the countdown, you're checking is everything right? Is everything right? And it can be in that very last you. Know, less than a second when the computers look at it go nope there's a valve not right or we were expecting fuel to move and we're not going to launch and that's why i you never know a launch is going to happen and, until it happens and they can be um changed much further out for all sorts of different reasons so it, it could be weather or things um aren't quite ready and and uh, or just you know circumstances collide so that uh Things aren't happening. You can imagine th this summer with with everything that's been happening with the coronavirus. It, it's played havoc with a lot of schedules right. and uh, yeah, sort of payloads that I'm expecting to go to the International Space Station or shifting around and launches are moving all over the place. So there's, there's so many different factors go in, and, in, and until you see something going into space, you can never quite be certain. Yeah. And so. It, it did well for me, though, because um, when I was uh, much younger, um, I, I was lucky enough to, to have a trip, uh, thanks to the European Space Agency, actually, out to French Guiana, where we were at the start of um, this, this stream. And uh, it was a long story to why I was there. But um, I was not going to see a launch. I was just going out to see the, them. Um, and there was a launch due the previous week, which there was the Rosetta spacecraft, which people might remember was the craft that landed on the comet. Um, and it got rained off and they slipped it a week. And so I just happened to be in French Guiana oh, wow. um, and, ha and got to see Rosetta launch, which oh, at the no. time I, I had 
I had no comprehension. It was going to take 10 years to get there. It, it, was, it was when this was in my early 20s. 10 years when you're 22 seems like a, a lifetime. Because yeah. um, it was, it was half a lifetime away. Um, but it was, so I was ever so lucky to see that. But you never know what's going to cause launches to, to shift and, and move. That's amazing. And you also went out to uh, NASA when you were 17, didn't you? Yeah, I, I've been incredibly lucky. I was um, at school. And so when I, when I grew up, I have always been interested and fascinated by space and, and particularly human space flight, the stories of astronauts and landing on the moon. And it was as I was going through school and in my teenage years, I, I sort of suddenly started to realize that there was a space industry and it wasn't actually just away at NASA, um, but we had a British space industry. And so that maybe I could work in that one day. And so I was starting to think then maybe I could work in the British space industry. Um, but what happened when I was 17, we had to work out some work shadowing. My friends were heading off to the, you know, right to theaters and or local offices and, and all of them wanted to be vets and doctors. And they were writing to people saying, can I come and see what you do? And myself and a friend went, well, we want to work for NASA one day. <laughs> so we emailed them. So I didn't think they'd say yes. And, and they wrote back and they said yes. And uh, that, 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 was, that was what led me to, to spend two weeks um, at the Johnson Space Center. And, and that was where I, I saw firsthand human space flight and, and sort of I came back and I want to work in mission control one day. It, it, it just seemed amazing. But I didn't actually think at that point I would ever get to do any of it. It was, it was just a mad, crazy dream that I sort of had in the back of my mind and just went back to going, right, what are my A-levels and what am I going to study at university? And there's always one of my messages out to anyone sort of planning careers. You've got to have the mad, crazy dreams. You've got, you've got to stick them out there. Um, and if you don't ask, you don't get. I would never have gone to NASA if I hadn't at least asked. Um, right. But I, th I, think any, I think anyone who, who, who sort of in any field people do, you go, oh, you ask an Olympian. Did you think you'd do this? You you dream of being an Olympian, but no one has the roadmap to get from you know their their uh, field kicking around playing football or running around the athletics track. It's it's just the mad crazy dreams you've got to have in the back of your mind to steer your decisions through life. Yeah, I've shadowed a lawyer for my work experience. If, I'd, <laughs> if I'd known I could make video games, I wouldn't have uh, bothered with that. But yeah, yeah, and and. <laughs> Yeah, now I, 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 yeah. We, we digress, but yeah, I, I get a bit frustrated that, that no one in, in your school or your careers advisor said you can go make video games, yeah. and here you are. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I got eventually. I'm yeah, much better at this than being a lawyer. <laughs> I did six months in pest control <laughs> as a teenager. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was my work experience. Yeah, best days um, of my life. Best, best days of my life, man. It was amazing. We're not going to make a pest control game next, no, probably. No, no, no. Well, no, we'll be on the list, maybe. <laughs> oh, bad news about that Saturn flyby, guys. Oh, no, I can see it drifting off. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> More space <laughs> junk to I'm add. Afraid I, I let it get too cold. Ah. Oh. That'll happen. That'll happen. Do you know what? That was a long wait. Imagine waiting all that time, building the rocket, building the probe, waiting for it to get all the way to Saturn, just for some mook. Press the wrong button. <laughs> Got too over. cold. Yeah, I guess if anything goes wrong in actual space stuff, there's not like one person that you can go, oh, Dave. <laughs> it? there's, there's... No, it, it is always, it, it's like anything in life, actually. Um, there's, a, there's a philosophy that I was taught in my time in mission control called the whole of cheese model. And when something Tell goes wrong, um, when something goes wrong, and, and you look at this in anything, there are usually lots of moments when it could have been stopped and you sort of have all these holes of cheese and they just line up and and so it, it, if you imagine slicing it the cheese into slices the holy cheese that you can have problems in, in different places but they don't normally propagate and when something really bad happens it's it's because you know it, for whatever reason and and there are always things that people just haven't they've thought about or they have they they didn't think about that or, or people weren't quite communicating properly and it's just when normally sort of x y z a and b all happen to line up and if any one of them hadn't happened you wouldn't have had the big problem right. and there's always uh you go back and you learn lessons and, and you, you try and make it right for next time we learn um from what happens and what goes wrong and um you, you go back to um, the Beagle 2 landing, which was um, UK's uh, little Mars probe that was, was gone and discovered. And it was due to land on Christmas Day um, back uh, you know, some, some years ago. 
and it, it we didn't hear from it. And everyone had assumed it had crashed, actually. And there were there was a whole load of, of lessons learned that we've now taken forward into uh, the Rosalind Franklin rover that's that's due to land and, and future ones saying we didn't we 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 were forced through the Beagle Two um choices. Mm-hmm. It was cheap and it was quick and that forced the design down a way that meant we didn't have communication with the spacecraft as it descended down through the atmosphere to Mars. So we didn't know what happened. And actually, everybody had assumed it had crashed. And, and, and that's the lesson we've taken forward. We now always hear back from people. But just a couple of years ago, um, photographs orbiting around Mars looked at the launch site and saw Beagle 2 was there. It had got down. It hadn't crashed. But the solar panels, it had this design where different solar panels had to unfold before the radio transmitter could talk to Earth. Right. And the last one didn't work for some reason. Oh, my goodness. So, you, you know, you know, even then when you look back and you go, what happened? Sometimes you can draw the wrong conclusions just because you don't have all the data. Um, so that this is it's one of the reasons I find mission control and space operations and all of that so fascinating because it's, it's problem solving and um, all kinds of different things. And it's so applicable to all kinds of different ways of life. And, you know, you, you, uh, you, you lock yourself out of the house and you go, how did that happen? And you go, well, because I thought I had my keys and I didn't check my keys and I, the spare set that was round the back wasn't there because I didn't replace it. And if any one of those things hadn't have happened, you wouldn't have been locked out of the house. And then you learn yeah. the lessons and you make sure your neighbor has a spare set of keys for next time or, or something. It's the same sort of processes. And I guess similarly, so obviously in uh, Mars Rising, you make all the decisions in mission control and you run it your own way. But hmm. in real life there, how many people are involved in like one mission launching a rocket? Oh yeah, hundreds, hundreds, thousands in, in some cases. And I think looking at this and seeing what it is, it is wonderful that it captures all these different uh, decision points and different angles. But yes, in reality, it's lots and lots of people who are one person's looking at the design of one tiny little bit of the spacecraft and somebody else is out negotiating the politics with can you fly this thing and do you want to work in collaboration with this? And, and it's where there are just so many, so many different roles and so many different ways in um, and there really and truly is, 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 is something for, for everybody. And if, if space excites you, there's, there's a job in the industry somewhere to, to use your skill set. You don't have to go and be a, a scientist. You don't have to be an engineer. The, always, always the advice I give to people, and they say, how do I be an astronaut? How do I work in the space industry? Do the things you enjoy because you'll do them well and you'll find a path through life that, that excites you and you'll do well at it. And if... You, you know, space is something you enjoy. You go and look to see how you can apply your skills to it. Do they need pest controllers? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, in its own way, we really do because the International Space Station is full of humans and so they're swabbing um, it for bacteria. Once a week, we want to make sure that it's clean. Right. Um, there are people working out how do bacteria grow in space and the applications of that, how do bacteria grow in space and they form these things called... Um, biofilms on the surfaces you get bacteria growing there that has applications and, and is linked to what happens to algae that grow on ships that then slow right. ships down going through um the sea so yeah there are people who are looking at how do you control um you know microbes that we don't want to be there in space and if you want to go to mars well then we really want to make sure that we don't take any life from mars to, right. from earth to mars and vice versa so Pest control, in its own way, is something we can do in space. We don't want any real biker mice on Mars. <laughs> Who knows what happened? Right. Okay. <laughs> well, listen, I'm gonna. We're gonna start doing the last mission before we wrap this up. I'm, we're gonna go for the Mars flyby. Oh, oh, good end to this. We're not gonna land. No, we're That's not gonna fine. land yet. We didn't. It's this is the mid '80s. I, I didn't quite get uh... time to uh, to research a lander. So we're just gonna go for the. Oh, look at that! What a beautiful evening for a launch. <sighs> Oh, perfect. Lovely new clouds in there as well. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> great, great job on the clouds, Pete. Cheers, mate. Thanks, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's have a look. So, what's the reliability on this one, Mike? I, I think it was good. it was high. It was ninety six. So oh, that's, that's very good for us. Something along the low. Jim, could, could this be? Are we about to finish a stream without blowing up a rocket? Maybe. Oh, the most successful stream ever. There we go. Oh, perfect. Look at that. Good one. Beautiful. We've come so far as a space agency. Right. Yeah, the stream we did with uh, Paul Smith. 
that's when we launched several of our own orc notes and all three of them died five minutes before the end of the stream <laughs> so we were like thanks everyone goodbye so, so so what have we learned Jem, that could be applicable in real life we've learned don't be afraid to reschedule mm -hmm. we've learned always install the battery backup always yeah. have a battery backup um what else have we learned do things that enjoy, you enjoy yeah yeah right and if it's pest control you can still come yeah. work in space <laughs> well this is it and we've, we've learned right. we've learned so much on the stream today libby uh hustle that's a big one that you're promoting hey basically yeah. <laughs> get, go get those opportunities like if you don't ask you don't get that's a very yeah. important life lesson yeah. <laughs> but be nice to people yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah yeah and there's yeah, there's so many areas of space people can work in. So like, mm. wherever you are good at, you'll be useful there. So make sure yes. you look into it. Cause, yeah, I didn't realize how many roles there are uh, until we started working with um, space agencies to create the game. And then we mm. wait um, the beta. We got the European Space Agency to play it, and we had all different staff members from different roles messaging us back. And yes, yeah, so we had people designing rockets. People who are in charge of scheduling, mm. budgeting, and they were like, it's so cool to see my role in a game. Um, mm. Yeah, and it just showed how many different skill sets are needed. Yeah, and and something that can people come at it from all sorts of different angles. So it's it's never too late to start going. Can I plan a little way into it? If that's you know halfway through your career, and I've missed out. I can go work in the space industry. You can come join us. And if you know, people are young and thinking, well, what do I study and what do I do? What's the one degree I need to do to work in space? Or work in the space industry? Do, do do whatever because there are different ways in. Um, and uh, talk to people. Do your research. Can kind of figure out and and do things you enjoy. Always. Um, there are people out there always who'll try and tell you you shouldn't do it because of what you look like or where you come from or so on. And it's got nothing to do with you as a person and what you enjoy doing and what you're capable of doing and want to do. So, yeah, don't the, to the naysayers. Yeah, hundred percent. Mm. Amazing advice. Okay, well. We're just coming up to the probe, ending up at Mars, where we'll pick it up again. There he goes. Is that ours? Oh, there's our one there. Here he goes. Come on. Oh, we're getting him. Nearly there. Here we go. Okay, let's try and not. Let's try and do. I mean, okay, I lost one probe. That's not bad. But let's 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 try and keep this one together. Oh. Watching them. I've got a slight delay on my stream, so I'm like <laughs> watching with the audience. It should be. It should be fine. I'm pretty confident about this one. I think I might be able to do it in a one. -er. Be a nice way to end. It would be a nice way to end. <laughs> okay. Ooh. Super, super good so far. Comms and a power. It's turned into three data. So we're gathering our data. Uh oh, we're going to have to use a little bit of power to resist this, something's gone wrong, it is signal attenuation, that's fine, I think we've got, we ha I have saved up enough power to just resist that, so, okay, complete task, there we go, Libby, Libby you have granted good luck onto our agency, yeah, you've been really <laughs> good, good luck charm for us, thank you, <laughs> I'm happy to help, so, yeah, look at that, yeah, oh, a little uh, reward, yeah. Our mission patch. And we are getting closer to being uh, good enough to go for that final Mars mission. Oof, right, let's go for the day there. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Libby. Um, you've hey. been fascinating. <laughs> you've got, given us some great advice, uh, not only in how to play the game, but, <laughs> but also in how to how to get into space, how to enjoy space, real life, and Mars how to right enjoy there. life as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. I think. The advice right now is go and find a cool drink. I think to everybody, yeah. if you're in this kind, of, if you're in the UK anyway, or at least down, yeah, around my, uh, my area. It's far too hot. The space yeah. suit is not the most breathable. <laughs> Let's end by having a good old look at that sun, then. Blimmin' Nora. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Uh, it's just like that picture of my flat, a live stream. That sun. <laughs> Crikey. Okay, well, listen, thanks everyone for joining us. We had fun today. Um, wish this Mars Horizon, keep an eye out for it. Uh, follow UK Space Agency, uh, everything they do, and ESA as well. Hey, follow all the space agencies because everything that they do is for the good of mankind. <laughs> yeah, and then you'll always be posting about the other events and ways that you can get involved. So it's a good way to see that. And make sure you're following us on socials, and then you'll be able to hear as soon as we announce a release date and all the other exciting updates about the game.
Yep. Hope you liked all the new stuff we showed you on stream today uh, as well. And again, thanks, Livy. That was great. Um, hey, thank you. Okay. Bye, everyone.